1878 by Elisha Hoffman. He was a Presbyterian minister from Pennsylvania. It was published in Spiritual Songs for Gospel Meetings and the Sunday School. It, as we mentioned before, it became a marching song for the Salvation Army. The song contains many Bible references and allusions to they have washed their robes and made them white of the blood of the Lamb. And that was Revelations 7.14. Uh, the uh, Elijah Hoffman, he served with the Evangelical Association Publishing Division in Cleveland for 11 years. Throughout his lifetime, he penned more than 2,000 gospel songs. Are you washed in the blood? There's one. Leaning on the everlasting arms was another one. Uh, this hymn asks the reader or singer if they've been restored and redeemed by the love and power of Jesus. Its powerful lyrics inquire into the commitments of its audience to their Savior, the Son of God. So we're going to sing first, second, and last verse. And you can have it there in your seat. Uh, don't just an extra copy. <clears throat> One, two, and four. One, two, and four. And those who are able, please stay. <laughs>
our devotional today is titled Rejoice. And it's interesting because I didn't know what Philip was going to talk about. <laughs> but, you know, it fits right in there, doesn't it? Amen. Um, our scripture is Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Amen. Now the call to rejoice runs right through scripture. From Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy to Revelation. There are more than 250 instances where the word rejoice can be found. Joy is one of the prime fruits of the Spirit. It is a gift of God to all who walk closely with their Lord. Our devotional life is where we learn to think those positive thoughts that will enable our spirits to rejoice. And a lot depends on the perspective from which you look at your life. You can choose to look at it positive, find happiness, or you can choose to find all the problems in any one situation. And if you can choose to be happy, to appreciate, then you can appreciate each moment. You can get to that point where you appreciate each moment. and the Holy Spirit will be with you. Now, of course, there are times for all of us when we get out of bed in the morning and it's all we can do to face the day. The last thing we want to know is that somebody tells us we should rejoice. On those days, we prefer to feel sorry for ourselves. And we need to find a sympathetic ear. And we're all in that position sometimes. And we need to find someone who will listen as we pour out our troubles. But we would all be happier, uh, be a happier whole person if we concentrate on the positive and begin the day by praising the Lord for all the blessings that we have and we have many. <coughs> and genuinely start to rejoice by looking for the good in every situation instead of seeing the problems and seeing the bad points. Now, sometimes the reason that we lose our joy is because it is placed in the wrong things. The wrong things are the source of our joy. If our joy comes from our finances, our occupations, our relationships, our activities, our homes, all of the things that are important to us, but if that's where our basic joy comes from, then what happens when those things fall apart, as they sometimes do? then our joy is lost. But when God is the source of our joy, then we will never lose that joy. No matter what happens, your basic joy will always be with you. Through it all, despite it all, we rejoice in knowing that we are God's and He loves us and the Holy Spirit is always available to us. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day, for this church and this class. Grant us an understanding of the profound joy of your holy purpose. Help us to be friends in the faith to one another, companions who give strength and support to one another. Guide us in all that we think and do that our lives may reflect your glory. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am not going to reiterate too much of Susan's summary of things that she did a couple of weeks ago, but uh, I uh, kind of do feel the need to sort of summarize the quarter just a little bit. Um, the title of our summer quarter, as you know, is The Righteous Reign of God. And honestly, uh, from the first Sunday in June through the end of August, we are going, we're going to be looking at the kingdom of God 
well, we have been and are going, going to continue looking at the kingdom of God from different perspectives. Um, unit one, if you'll recall, during June, we had five Sundays when we were reading from the prophets. Uh, specifically, uh, two Sundays we read from Isaiah and one Sunday from Ezekiel, which are the uh, two of the major prophets, and then we read from Zephaniah and Zechariah, two of the minor prophets who were foretelling uh, the, uh, they were proclaiming uh, God's power, and that, that was the title of the unit. But, but what they were really talking about is uh, God the Father's ability to establish a kingdom of righteousness, justice, and peace. Those are key words in all of those prophecies. Righteousness, justice, and peace. <coughs> now, not all of them give us the verses that we are most familiar with, and we read a lot during Advent, which was forecasting the coming of the Messiah. Uh, but uh, all of this has to do with the coming of the kingdom. Okay. All right, so then we fast forward into this month, and we've been talking about the, the, the unit title of this month was Jesus, the Messiah, envisions the kingdom. And he, um, I think the first Sunday, if you guys will recall, was that little um, scuffle he had with the Pharisees in the temple, uh, as was his practice because he was uh, <coughs> compassionate and caring. Uh, he did not let uh, the way the Pharisees interpreted the law stop him from doing good things on the Sabbath, from healing and casting out demons. And if you'll recall, in that particular lesson, uh, the Pharisees were, um, because they were really jealous of a lot of the attention he was getting, said that he was casting out demons in the name of Satan, the devil, not in the name of God, his father. And, uh, and, and the whole point of that story was perceiving the kingdom in the present. And just on a personal note, I don't know if you all remember when the Disciple Bible Study first came out in the early 90s. Well, I lived in Hendersonville, Tennessee then, and I went to First Methodist there, United Methodist there, and our minister, our pastor, uh, led the first disciple Bible studies, the Red Book, if y'all remember, uh, and one of the books that we study is Matthew, and uh, I was in that first group, and then the next fall, he wanted to do uh, a morning group for stay-at-home moms, or nurses, other people who had jobs but really could schedule their work hours to be available to do, do that study. And so I agreed to lead it. And it, it was then, and I was in, like in my late 30s, you know, I always thought kingdom of heaven is somewhere we go after we die, right? right. Kingdom of heaven. We go there after we die. Okay. Well, this is the first time because Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven a lot, and Jesus says a lot, according to Matthew, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is now, you know, and that. And so that was the first time, a lot, like this little light bulb went off in my head. I go, I don't have to wait to experience the kingdom of heaven. I can do it right here and right now, you know, you know, in this life. And so um, I think that's one of the things in that little, little thing with the Pharisees was I think the point Jesus was trying to make is I'm here, I'm showing you the kingdom through my teaching, preaching, signs, wonders, healings. Why don't you see it? It's here. It's here. It's not out there somewhere in the future. It's here. So that was the first thing, and that, 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 that was a true story. Okay. So then, the next uh, two Sundays, uh, and, and today, uh, we uh, find <coughs> Jesus teaching in one of his favorite teaching methods, which is parables. And as Susan said a couple of weeks ago, there's a couple of definitions in, in the teacher's guide uh, 
of, of parables, which I think are really good. Parables are an earth, earthly story with a heavenly meaning, or uh, parables are real or imaginary events in nature or in common life adapted to suggest a moral or religious truth. Okay? Now, uh, one of the points that they make is that context is key. And I don't know, I think I did one of the lessons on Isaiah, uh, the, maybe the first Sunday in July. And I remember talking about how so much of the prophets wrote in Hebrew poetry and how hard Hebrew poetry is to understand. And I think I brought up the parables. Like, some, I, you know, sometimes I, I know Jesus taught that way so that the people would understand, but I don't understand them, some of them. And then we talked about revelation and how hard it is to understand because it's also... Um, it's apocalyptic literature and uses a lot of symbolism, visions, dreams, that kind of thing. So anyway, so it, that it was interesting to me then that the, that the very next month or the very next unit, here we have these wonderful explanations of some of the parables. And uh, of course, the one that we studied uh, uh, two weeks ago was the parable of the sower. We're all pretty familiar with that one. As a matter of fact, I think Pastor Philip and Pastor Dale did a whole sermon series on that. When was that, back in the fall? I can't remember. But they actually demonstrated the different kinds of soil and, you know, yeah, or, or um, our worship uh, person set, set those up for us. And so we actually had something to look at as well as to hear. Um, but the interesting thing I thought about that one is that I've always looked at that, like when I've read the parable of the sower, I've kind of thought to myself, well, what kind of soil am I, you know? And I struggle sometimes with the thorns. I have to tell you, I do, you know? Um, so uh, so I got, that got me thinking about that. But the other perspective is the perspective of the sower, and I think that's what Susan brought out, uh, was that as um, ambassadors for Christ, we are to sow the seeds of the gospel everywhere, right? And back in the day, and this, this spoke to them back in their context, because what did those folks do primarily? They farmed, right? So, and they didn't have all this fancy equipment like we have today, you know, the big <laughs> tractors and the combines and all that that sow the seed for you. They had to do everything by hand. So they knew as they were hand casting, or if you've ever tried to sow grass seed that way, you know when you're hand casting that some of it's going to land where it's probably not going to do much of anything. Well, the point is, is that you sow that seed anyway. And uh, in my life, I've heard some great sermons and then an altar call, and I've been sitting there thinking, oh, no, nobody's going up there. Like, oh, the pastor must be so disappointed, you know? <laughs> but, it's, but all he does is sow the seed, and it's the Holy Spirit convicting that person, right. you know, to make the commitment, right? Right, to confess, repent, and make the commitment um, to Jesus. So, uh, but we're to sow that seed everywhere. We don't know, you know, how it's going to turn out in that person's life. We can pray for them. We certainly can do that. But it's but it's up to that person and that person's relationship with God in here. Okay. All right, so that, uh, you know, so I, I really thought about that one a lot. Then last week, here's the weeds and the uh, wheat. And that, Mark said he didn't understand why the disciples didn't get that. And honestly, they probably should have. And it's really one of the easier ones for us to understand. But what was interesting in the teacher's guide is that the Greek word for weed, they think refers to this weed, invasive weed, that grows in Palestine that you really can't tell. Like as it's sprouting and growing up, it looks just like weed. 
So if if the owner had said yes, like the like the work people wanted to do, go out and pull the weeds out of the wheat, <clears throat> nine times he probably would have lost a lot of weed. Not just because they uprooted it along with the weeds, but they would have mistaken the wheat for the weeds. Okay, and so that it, that. That there again is, is a uh, context in the first century that we in the 21st century might not understand. Okay, so now we're going to get to today's lesson. And these are, you know, some of Jesus' parables were full length narratives, full length story, kind of with an intro and, and the narrative and a summary or the, the solution at the end. A really good essay. But uh, some of them are really short. And today's lesson has two or three very, very short. Uh, the, the, whoever wrote the teacher's guide likens the longer story parables to like an email message. And these little one paragraph or two sentence parables, as, as uh, he compares those to a tweet. Okay? Because very few words, not a lot of elaboration or anything like that. But to understand them, sometimes it's good to know the context. Here again, the context. Okay, I'm going to, we start, our lesson today comes again from Matthew th uh, chapter 13, verses 44 through 52, but I'm going to read the parable that starts in verse 47 first. I'm going to read a little bit out of order, and you'll see why in just a minute. Okay, so Jesus is teaching again, and he said, Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad fish away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous, and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? All right, now, contextually, we also had a lot of farmers that lived in Palestine, I mean, uh, fishermen who lived in Palestine at that time. As a matter of fact, Jesus recruited several of them, right? Remember Peter and Andrew, James and John? Yep, right out of their boats. And uh, they talk about can, this would have meant something to the crowd because my first question was, what's the difference between good fish and bad fish? I don't, you know, they're all good to me. <laughs> so some are a little bony than others, you know. But you know, um, but I, I like all kinds of fish. So uh, so I go, I, I don't understand that. Well, it says in here, by one estimate, there are 24 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee today although it is impossible to know how many there were in the time of Jesus. In Leviticus, in the Law of Moses, it stipulates that only fish with scales and fins were considered clean and could be eaten. This made animals such as eels, which have no scales or fins. Well, they may have fins. Yeah, they may have fins. But anyway, no scales. Various types of catfish that are in the Sea of Galilee, which have smooth skin and no scales, and any shellfish, which wouldn't have any, any scales or fins. So all those were unclean. So if they pulled them up in their big cast nets, or their same, I call them same nets, but drag nets, I guess, and they, would, they, they were big and they were weighted on the bottom, so they would, you would get some fish from the shallows and some fish that were deeper. And they would just, uh, uh, one, one boat would manage this side, one boat would manage the other. And, they, and when it got full, they would, just, they would just carefully kind of figure out how to trap everything and then drag it up on shore because it would be too heavy to pull it to a boat. And that's where they would do the sorting. So that's, what, that's kind of what that's all about. But I didn't even think about there being fish that would not be uh, personally or, uh, or commercially uh, interesting to them at all because they were unclean, okay? So, um, so anyway, but the meaning of this parable, of course, is very similar to which one? The wheat and the weeds, right? And it's all about the end times and separating the righteous from the unrighteous, okay? 
All right, very good. And then uh, we have two more uh, short parables today, and these have to do not with, uh, not so much with uh, living the kingdom life in a sinful world, which is kind of the way I summarize the wheat and the weeds and the fish, uh, clean and unclean, but uh, this is about valuing the kingdom. Uh, and uh, the examples or the parables that Jesus uses is the parable of hidden treasure. Let me read that one next. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Now, most of us today would probably say, well, finders keepers, losers weepers, you know? Uh, a lot of people would just pick that up and well, they'd look around and pick it up and walk off with it. But here's the thing. Back in Jesus' time, in the first century, the person that owned the field owned the treasure. And the reason why is that people back then, they didn't have built-in or portable fireproof safes to keep valuables, so they buried them. Or they hid them in caves or under a rock or something like that. Somehow or another, and usually in a box or a jar or something. So somehow or another, this guy's walking along and he sees something interesting in the field. And he goes over and looks and he goes, hmm, that might be worth something. But he can't pick it up because picking it up would be stealing against Jewish law. The other ordinance has to do with, with whoever owns the field owns what's in the field. So that's why he thought, I think that's worth something, so I'm going to sell everything I've got and buy that property. Now, here's kind of the risk that he took by doing that. He didn't really know what the treasure was because it was either un under a rock or just partially exposed, let me put it that way. So he didn't really know what the treasure was. Uh, and by the time he went and sold all that he had and actually bought the property, he could have come back and what was there might have been gone. So he sort of took a, a gamble by doing that, but he, ha he had the faith that whatever that was was worth more than all that he had. And so he, he did that. And that's kind of what faith as Christians is. We have faith in, in the hope of our salvation and uh, resurrection from the dead. And that someday we, we will live in the kingdom of heaven uh, here on earth. Well, we do live in the kingdom of heaven here on earth, but someday in heaven with the Father and the Son. Right? And next year, uh, next year, next Sunday, we're actually going to talk about, uh, as children of God and co-heirs <coughs> of the kingdom with Jesus, um, that, uh, that how we actually live the kingdom life, you know, inheriting the kingdom and how we live that life. And actually, it does have to do, believe it or not, with the fruits of the Spirit, which I struggle with those, too. So that would be an interesting, interesting uh, lesson for me. Anyway, the other, um, the other uh, parable is about uh, a pearl. And here again, uh, shellfish were considered unclean, so the oyster itself was of no value to anybody. But as it turns out, in uh, most cultures and civilizations back in the first century, pearls were very highly valued, even more uh, some, some places and sometimes than gold, silver, or other precious uh, stones. So pearls were very valuable, and this, uh, this is about uh, a, a merchant, a pearl merchant. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. So what he would be looking for then is probably the size of the pearl, 
the shape of the pearl, like as spherical as possible, the color of the pearl, the luster of the pearl, things like that. And he was experienced. He was a pearl merchant. So when he saw that, he immediately, and he may have not even been at home, so he may have had to go back home and sell some property to come back and buy it. He sold everything that he had to buy that pearl. I think what Jesus is trying to tell us here, or ask us, is do we value uh, citizenship or, uh, yes, I guess that would be the way to put it if you're talking about a kingdom, citizenship in the kingdom of God. How much do we value that? And are we willing to sacrifice everything that we are and everything that we have for the kingdom? Because that's really, you know, what is asked of us not really just asked, but required as children of God. And um, so um, that is a question that we can all ponder and think about. Um, yeah, it's a tough question. One of the ways we might apply this is um, one of the things that the, the teacher's guide uh, asks is it, it, it says, imagine that your house is on fire. Your family and pets are safe, but you have time to grab one item as you escape. What would you grab and why? Grab Just a one. thought. Just a thought. And then it says one of the firefighters has a chance to save one item for you. They haven't asked you what, what would they think was the most valuable item in your house. So what do we value and how much are we willing to give up to acquire and keep uh, the kingdom, really, kingdom. Then the other thing that the teacher's guide uh, sort of challenges us to do, we've talked a lot about parables and the, and the need to know the context of the audience that Jesus was teaching. And why these parables were easy for them to understand and sometimes harder for us because we're, let's face it, we're two centuries later, right? So it challenges us if we're trying to uh, share the gospel, which we're, we're sowers, so we're supposed to be sharing the gospel wherever we go. Uh, what sort of modern day analogies or parables that we could create to describe the kingdom of heaven to people today. That's very thought provoking. Very thought provoking. Because we've, ha we've ha talked about this before, is my, my fear and really my sadness is that so, much, so many people in the world don't grow up knowing Jesus like we did, most of us. Um, or learning about Jesus as we grew up. Uh, and uh, so they, they consider Christianity and the Bible sort of uh, a bunch of hooey, I guess. You know, uh, myths, folk tales, not, you know, that, that don't really have a whole lot of relevance to their lives today. So I guess. One of our challenges is to figure out a way to tell other people about Jesus, who he, well, was when he was here on earth, who he is to us, and, um, and explain uh, or, or describe what we, what the kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace, um, that the prophets describe uh, in a way that people can relate to it. Um, we talk about this all the time. We were talking earlier today uh, about our personal mission field 
And my daughter, um, she goes to a contemporary church over in uh, the Panhandle. She lives in Defuniac Springs. <coughs> And she was talking about circles of influence, and she said, this isn't really biblical, but you can't, you can't go up, to, most of the time you can't go up to an unbeliever, somebody that has no exposure at all, or doesn't know you at all personally, and talk to them. There has to be a door that opens. She was talking about the value of small groups, Sunday school classes, women's groups, men's groups, things like that. Because if you can, uh, uh, somebody that is visiting um, or that you meet, if you can get them to come with you to a group, uh, then you share that history with them. And then there's other ways that you move the circle. She talks about Peripherals, peripheral circles, and, and then you're moving them. The more history that you share, the more they, they will listen and trust what you say, and well, vice versa, you know, that kind of thing. So we were talking about, you know, here we start close with family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, you know, your personal mission field, and, um, and then I guess when you run out of unbelievers there, you know, God, God uh, says, okay, well, how about uh, share something with that waitress that you know waits, you know, waits on you at uh, at the Metro Diner or something like that, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But um, but it, it it is challenging to come up with a way. Um, uh, the Lord. Uh, uh, challenges us to spread the word, but it is, it is challenging in this day and age, I think, uh, to do it in such a way that uh, people relate, maybe to what you're talking about. Um, the only way I really know is to try to live my life um, as close to the image of Jesus. I, th I think all the time, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? and uh, uh, try to live my life and, uh, and with, uh, with, we were talking about rejoicing with joy and peace in my heart. That's what makes a big difference to a lot of people. They see something in you that they don't have and a lot of their other people they know don't have. And so then they ask you, what is that? Like, you know, and uh, that opens the door. So anyway, uh, I guess that's all I got to say about that. Oh, one other thing. The, the last little thing, um, it, uh, uh, just, this is just real quick. In the scripture was, um, Jesus asked at the end, have you understood all of these things? And the disciples replied, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And I think what he's talking about there, it, here again, kind of referring to the Pharisees and the scribes who were the chief teachers at that time, but us too. There's value in the Old Testament law and prophecy as well as in the gospel in the New Testament. So we can use both of those as the Holy Spirit leads us to um, share with other people. Okay. All right. Well, let's have a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we know what we should do. We know what you ask us to do. Actually, uh, in truth, what you have commissioned us to do. But sometimes in our world today, we find it hard to figure out how to introduce you to unbelievers, to introduce the good news of your salvation to new believers um, in a way that, honestly, we don't alienate, alienate them from the get-go. Um, help us to find analogies, uh, construct our own parables that, um, that 
so that we can find a way to share the good news uh, with others because uh, our society and our world today surely does need it. Anyway, we pray all of these things, Jesus, in your name, uh, uh, our Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So my grandfather's house did catch on fire, and uh, it's out in the country, and they didn't have the, the, the water to put it out. And so the, the only thing we saved from the house was the family Bible. We went in and got the family Bible, because they recorded everything in it, like births, marriages, yes, yes. You know, yeah. deaths, they sure used to. And people used to use that as birth certificates, mm -hmm. like my dad did when he went into the army. Uh, he, Use that in the, in the Bible, but he did say that. The one thing he didn't say that he wished he had said was a drawer in the desk that had all these precious pictures and mm -hmm. types and things of, of people in the past. But he did say the family Bible. We we have it. That's right. Thank you, Betty Lou, and thank you, Melanie. And good morning, Asbury Glass. Good morning. Good morning. You know, it's always fun to go away, but it's always nice to come home. But speaking of joy, I have to share how little things bring you joy. Well, this was a big thing. The temperatures up in Michigan were in the 70s at night, <laughs> and 85 during the day, and no humidity. That was a big joy. <laughs> but the small joy was seeing rabbits and fireflies. Those are two things I do not see in Florida. Oh my goodness. Little tiny things like that just bring joy to your heart. Amen. All right, back to Florida. <laughs> we have received a very nice thank you card. I am so blessed to have the love and friendship of each of you. Please pass on to the class my thanks for their prayers and notes for my recovery. God bless you all. Betty Gergen. Oh. Aww. Yeah. So, if you get a chance, call Betty Gergen or stop by and just say, what can I do for you today? Um, and we've talked about taking her out for lunch. We haven't done it. Darn it, we're going to do it. And she, and emails. She's real yeah. sharp on the emails. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. she loves the emails, so. Are there any announcements this morning? We have a guest. I know, we have a guest. Oh my goodness. Would you stand up and kind of tell us a little bit about you? A little bit of what? Anything that you want, you could wish to share. Are you from Jacksonville or? No, I'm from Alabama. Oh, God! I've been here since 1968, so I feel like this is home. Yeah. And um, I've worked for 25 years at Moore's Children's Clinic, and I'm retired now. And uh, I'm uh, a real estate investor, and I also am a professional artist. And I teach a class if anyone would like to study art. And I'm very happy to be here. It was totally by accident. I showed up at the sanctuary. And the minister said, and the closing hymn. And I said, what? <laughs> I thought it was at 11. And so I ran into Pat, and she was kind enough to bring me here. Oh, it's nice to meet you. Well, 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 we hope well, you come again. Yes. Yeah. We used to meet at 10 o'clock, and then they changed our service times around. So now it's a little weird, but we meet here. But yes, look how it worked out. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I told Philip this morning at the close of the service that the goat side had a lot more people in it this morning. <laughs> I hope you're sitting on the goat side. <laughs> uh, all right, Bill, you want to leave us laughing? Yes. <laughs>
regular visit to my doctor, I asked him, how do you determine whether or not an older person should be put in an old age facility? Well, he said, we fill a bathtub, and then we offer a teaspoon, a teacup, and a bucket to the person to empty the bathtub. Oh, I understand, I said. A normal person would use the bucket because it's bigger than the spoon or the teacup. He said, no, a normal person would pull the plug. <laughs> Do you want a bed near the window? <laughs> it will all stand, it will be dismissed. <laughs>